so I think we're, you know, we're sort of winding down now, and um, and like I said, one of the questions that I would like to, I usually end off with, and 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 think it's it's helpful sometimes, is to ask people what are the happiest memories or the happiest there's the happiest time of your life. Um, um, Well, I suppose it's when you were having children in your in your early married years, and and uh, you were not disillusioned mm-hmm. as you get as you get older, mm-hmm. and uh, the saddest, of course, were the deaths in the family. Do you, do you want to say anything for the record about Smith's death? Do you yeah, no, to? I really don't particularly. I mean, nobody um, knows what happened, and everybody has their own idea. And um, there's so much apparently going on now about writing about him that uh, I, I have, I would not, um, the man whose book has not come out yet, did seek an interview with me it's called several times and I s- kind of suspect his book is better than the first person's but he kept saying that he uh, uh, wasn't going to be sensational and well why did he pick her to write about it if he didn't <laughs> want to be sensational and uh, frankly I did read I mean, Nick Nick sent me this the book that's mm-hmm. just come out and I did read that because I like to, I think I ought to know what goes on. I, I really was not a, looking forward to reading it, but I did finish it. And um, at least he was, he was not um, uh, one-sided in that he was against the, that wealthy Southern family, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. as the newspapers were. The newspapers were very much sticking up for the, the little... Um, actress who came from New York that mm-hmm. was down in that horrible southern country mm-hmm. where everybody, where Ku Klux Klan, you mm-hmm. know, that type of thing was their attitude. Mm-hmm. And they really rallied around her being very bitter. Are you talking about like the New York papers? Probably? Yes. Mm-hmm. But they came right down. I mean, they were mm-hmm. right down there. And um, I, I thought this book, at the end, he's, he's had some mighty nice things to say about my family. Mm-hmm. I suppose you've read it. Mm-hmm. I mean, he certainly gave, gave Uncle Will a break and mm-hmm. his attitude toward Jewish people, which I was at least happy to see somebody <laughs> was saying something nice. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I, I think for a lot of people... It's but it was a tragic thing. This, Smith was a very strong character, and he makes him out as a very weak uh, drunkard, and he wasn't. He wasn't. He couldn't have done the things that he did and be yeah. that. Yes, he drank. He drank all. He, he really had such a steady head that he could drink um, with an adult and drink the adult under the table if that's what the adult wanted to do. And still Smith could, could function perfectly well. Mm-hmm. But he, he makes it out as though he were drunk all the time, which was, you couldn't have travel that way. Yeah. And I think Smith's log shows you uh, his character mm-hmm. to a certain extent. He was an excellent uh, mechanical and mathematical type of thing, which is runs in my family to, mm-hmm. to be um, that. And he was, he was always, you felt that he was, um, you could, I, I was an older sister, but I could never look on him as a younger brother. Mm-hmm. He was my age and adult age. Mm-hmm. Very sensible. Mm-hmm. He very had a very strong, um, a very strong uh, temper. He could could get very angry. But um, we we certainly treated him with a great deal of respect and with um, acknowledgement of of his of a superior intellect. And I think if he had lived, he would have, um, well, it was a tragedy for him to marry somebody like Libby. It really was. 
It was a tragedy for him to marry so young, mm -hmm. to marry Ann Cannon. He needed years to, to, to do what he wanted to do and grow up. Mm -hmm. Why do you think he married so young, or married the second time again so young? Was it, was it I just couldn't figure that out. I and mean, he didn't tell anybody he was married. Mm -hmm. I, well, I don't know. Uh -huh. I've often wondered if he if he knew it himself. <laughs> if it was a drunk that he didn't know he was married. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's right because um, in this log you find that he is meeting somebody. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say who and he's looking mighty forward to it. Mm -hmm. So he knew that she was coming to China. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe he didn't know she was married to her. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm something off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. in, in this book, this man says that he's solved the mystery. Do you think he's solved the mystery? No. Well, I mean, what has he solved? He just solved what everybody else has said off and on. What's he say? He says it's suicide? Is that what he said? I think so. Well... He's, he, he, he's just wants to sell a book and make some money or he wouldn't have chosen the subject to begin with. And then secondly, he, he doesn't leave any of the depravity out of, that, out of her life. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, um, he, the more depravity, the more people like to read a book mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And he's got it all in there. He's given the full, full money's worth by mentioning I, I'm, I'm not. I don't even know whether he's correct on her or not. But I have heard stories like that about him. Mm -hmm. But I'm no authority on on her life or um, his life with her. Mm -hmm. They, I saw them after they after they came back from China. And Jane was a little baby and admired. She admired Jane's little baby as a little baby very much. Mm -hmm. and that was it. But he's not accurate all the way. He's he's got things mixed up. He's got he mentions a little bit of everything. He mentions um, see he has but he has them in the wrong times. He has him uh, with an operation for mastoid, I think. And he has it. I remember that very clearly. That it was before I was twenty one, and there wasn't anyone around to sign sign them. Uh, for permission for the doctor to operate, and he had to have this mastoid operation. And it had some kind of infection in the back of your mm -hmm. head. And uh, so the hospital said, but we can't let you sign, you're not 21. Mm -hmm. I said, well, there isn't anybody else. My husband was sick in bed that time. He had an ulcer at mm -hmm. that moment. He could have signed probably. Mm -hmm. So they had to take my signature and hope for the best. So I know that wasn't the whenever time he said in the sure book it was um, I think he had him in I think he had him in Egypt having a mastoid and he had um, hepatitis in Egypt and which delayed his, his trip for a long time and that's a very debilitating thing and then to think he went on from the hospital on the rest of that uh -huh. trip with that hepatitis I think that's what it was. Mm -hmm. I did just so in the log. So, what what does that do to you as an individual and to you as a, a family, sort of having to live with with the speculation with with that kind of um, well, uh, sort you, of you get publicity to that uh, job every uh, of everything. Oh, I would run the opposite way. Anybody ask me for an interview, you're the, about the first that's ever had one. <laughs> well, yeah, and you, um, well, I just expect, I expect the worst of newspapers. <laughs> and I, that's not quite fair to them, but. I know when my nephews were, well, 
was Aunt Mary Ann was trying to grab Sapelo about three or four years ago. And the boys, some of the boys were in with her on it. And uh, so they sued. And they, oh, they were accusing me of murder and everything out in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. You remember? Mm -hmm. Um, somebody from the um, journal called up and uh, he asked if I'd like to make a statement. I said, well, I sure would like to, but I wasn't going to. <laughs> I didn't think I'd better. And I'm sorry I've forgotten his name because I did say, well, if I do, I'll call you up. And I did remember it for a while, but I never did make a statement. But um, he said, he was the only one that had any sympathy, really. He said, well, um, well, let's see, what did he say? He said, um, it looks like somebody ought to speak up for you. Not a soul has. And that's true. There wasn't a single soul that spoke up for me. But actually, I knew that, I knew that even they who were accusing me knew I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was um, absolutely outrageous. I'm still mad at him. <laughs> I bet. They call up occasionally, and one of them does, and one or two of them. Well, Pat sends me this thing. And I say, um, first time Pat called up. Are you not really? <laughs> I think, um, well, see, I, I feel like that, that, um, a lot of the, the publicity, a lot of, a lot of the writing that, um, has been done, and primarily about Smith or about your brother Dick, mm -hmm. it has, um, well, if it's true, it's one-sided, or it, mm -hmm. it hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been commented upon mm -hmm. by somebody who's close to mm -hmm. the events and knows it. And so, um, I mean, that was one of the reasons I wanted to ask, so that, you know, your comments would be on the record, and that would mm -hmm. be whether you want to open that record immediately or whatever that it would be there so mm -hmm. that um, if there are falsehoods and misimpressions that you feel are being perpetrated and um, you mean by this book that just came out this book or I think I think that book is so unimportant I wouldn't I wouldn't think of counteracting it just let it go I mean I think it's so obvious that he is um, trying to sell a book, mm -hmm. trying to make some money. And maybe he's trying to be as truthful as he can, but what he's doing is reporting, repeating what was said, what nobody knew was true or not. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't really see there's anything for me to comment on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, are there other things that you that you've thought of that I haven't asked you about that you'd like to... Mm -hmm, I'm sure, but... Uh, would you like to tell me a little bit, say, about Musgrove Plantation, how how long you've had that? And mm -hmm. well, let me see if I do. I feel like I might get into my... Well, it's kind of the... Um, t turn it off a minute. Let me just think. About <laughs> well, let's see. Um, we I visited Dick and Blitz down there in Sapelo and mm -hmm. fell in love. That was about 1937. Mm -hmm. And Dick had not had it for very long. And... Um, Henry and I went down there, and we stayed a couple of weeks, I think, with them that year. And then um, we decided we'd love that section of the country. So um, we, we rented a house at Sea Island and brought the children down the next January, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, we had just, um, we had three children then. Mm -hmm. But they, uh, Jane had to go to school, the others weren't in school, mm -hmm. and then Sea Island had a little school there that she could go to. So while we were there, um, renting on Sea Island, mm -hmm. we were looking for property to buy. Mm -hmm. And we saw the, we went up to St. Catherine's Island, which was an uh, island north of Sapelo, and it was just beautiful. I just fell for that island. It was um, empty. It wasn't like Sapelo with mm -hmm. a lot of people on it. There was only a, a white couple and a, and a black couple mm -hmm. living there. and. Uh, it was owned by a northerner, mm -hmm. and he was, it was for sale, and uh, it had a little, a little airfield, 
and it had the old button Gwinnett House. He was the son of the Declaration of Independence in, from, from Georgia, mm -hmm. and he signed his um, his signature so seldom that he has his most valuable signature on the uh -huh. on the Declaration of Independence. If uh -huh. you ever found a button Gwinnett. You'd, <laughs> In those days, they said it was worth fifty thousand, but today, you know, that would be five hundred thousand uh -huh. probably. So anyway, I wanted to buy it, but Henry did not, and he was right. I'm glad we didn't. But it always has rankled. I mean, uh, not rankled, but it's been something I wished I uh -huh. had. It had absolute virgin forest, pine grove after pine grove, a huge pine tree. And you know, I hadn't been back since until this year, huh. and the, the people that own it now, I had an opportunity to go up and spend a day. It was just wonderful. Well, anyway, we uh, did locate this empty land. It was, wasn't was any fine house on it or anything across from Seattle on St. Simon's Island. And it was a challenge of doing something right from scratch. Mm -hmm. We had to build the houses from scratch and road from scratch. And, mm -hmm. As I said, I love to decorate and build, mm -hmm. and so did Henry. So we and uh, we started in, and we we first built what we call the boat house, and that was the part of it was for housing boats, and it was I wanted it right half over a creek, so you just hoist the boat up from the creek and put it in like a swing it into the garage, you know, like they do mm -hmm. in shipyards. And uh, it, he didn't quite build it that way, and it had um, only two bedrooms and a bath upstairs, and one bedroom downstairs and a bath. And the downstairs, we had a little boat that we were chartering mm -hmm. this year, and we had uh, downstairs, the idea was would be the captain mm -hmm. that would be uh, living there. Mm -hmm. And uh, we could come and live, uh, and bring one couple with us mm -hmm. if we wanted to. A nice little living room, mm -hmm. and but the kitchen was just a a, um, a, a ball size, you'd say, you know, mm -hmm. just just mm -hmm. about like what I've got here. Uh -huh. And then uh, we liked it so much, we decided. Oh, and there was a nice house site further up the creek, over a, an open area that was a vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. And um, we decided that we liked the location of where this was, right on this little fishing creek. Mm -hmm. And you could see all the people, boats going by, you could sit on your porch and mm -hmm. wave to all the fishermen going by, crabbers and things mm -hmm. like that. And so we decided we would fix it to the extent that we could get our family in. So then we almost immediately changed it. We, we took the boat uh, section and mm -hmm. made a kitchen out of that and another bedroom. So mm -hmm. we had four bedrooms and a regular sized kitchen. And then we glassed in the uh, porch to make a dining room. Mm -hmm. And the um, pant the old kitchen became a pantry. And then we added one new house, which is March Cottage. And that's where, um, that was for us. And we can get away from the children mm -hmm. and be quiet and make a noise that we wanted to. And they couldn't hear us and they could make mm -hmm. a noise and we couldn't yeah. hear them. And uh, that had a bedroom and a sitting room and two baths. Mm -hmm. Now that March Cottage is where the president and and Rosalind uh -huh. stay, stay when they're down there, and we do too. Any honored guest stays uh -huh. in that. A King Hussein stayed in that house. And then you go over to the boathouse, you have a covered walk from one to the other. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's no distance, it's from here going across there. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's 50 feet or something like that. So then um, everything, um, um, the architect was really good, he was wonderful. Man, and he did it in the style of, um, well, I guess, Savannah style, with a balcony and iron rails. Mm -hmm. And Tabby, you know what Tabby is? It's, I'm not sure. Well, it was the cement that the Indians and the Spaniards made, and mm -hmm. it uh, has a lot of oyster shells in uh -huh. it. It's half, half sand, half water, and half burnt oyster shells. The burnt oyster shells gave the line that made the cement. Uh -huh. And uh, it's... Uh, it gives a crude look. I mean, this is not a polished looking house. In fact, one time a guest came in and they sat down in the living room and looked around and they said, oh, I've never been in a half finished house. Well, there were, you saw the, the rafters, do you mm -hmm. see? And then there was no plaster. Uh -huh. You had the outside and the inside and then nothing between. Mm -hmm. 
on the beam show, mm -hmm. for instance. So um, then um, I wanted a garden. Thing. So it was a wonderful uh, uh, landscape gardener down there. And I kept saying, Mommy, I want a garden. Where this vegetable garden is, I want a garden. Well, this was the house site for the future big house, if we ever wanted one. And he said, well, you can't have a garden till you have a house. And I said, well, I think that's nonsense. I said, you can build a house in uh, half a year, but you can't build, it takes you years for a garden to grow. So he wouldn't settle down to it at all. I, so one day I went out with a yellow pad and sat down on, under the trees where I thought the house would be if we ever built one, where the view was. And it, there was a, a thing of, of oak trees kind of like that. Where I was sitting, sort of a semicircle there, kind of, mm -hmm. not quite, just suggested. Mm -hmm. And there was a big bamboo tree here that carried out the same oval look. And opposite, across the way, were uh, three cedars, real old cedars, mm -hmm. great big trunks. And the marsh was out here, and you could see Sea Island way out here, opposite where the house would be. And um, we wanted a pool. So anyway, I sat down and I drew it out of, of the floor plan, you might say, of the garden. <laughs> and the pool I made uh, oval, and I had um, two little houses and across the back a fireplace. Mm -hmm. But it would be, um, it, was, it was a pergola with the fireplace outdoors. And um, the, each side of the fireplace was a men's room and a ladies' room for changing soup mm -hmm. into soup. One of the little houses, buildings with the roof, was the kitchen for cooking lunch, and the other was a two two house. But it looked they looked the mm -hmm. same on the outside. They were there. and then down at the other end, a pergola with no buildings around it, mm -hmm. just just columns, and an old oh, uh, an elliptical garden. Mm -hmm on three different levels so that you had it a lower level in the middle and then you stepped up about three or four steps to the uh, second level and the third level mm -hmm. and then out of the garden so you had it uh, a tiered mm -hmm. uh, terraced, terraced mm -hmm. is a better word. And then in the center of, uh, of the garden, um, um, a maze. You had a, a maze? A maze mm -hmm. of, of uh, evergreen. Uh -huh. Uh, Protocompass is that um, what they use down there instead of box. If you boxes, it's too hot down there for mm -hmm. box. Was this so, maze high enough so that you could get lost in it? And not really. No, uh -huh. you, you, no, we kept uh -huh. it low uh -huh. uh, with a um, sundial in the middle. Uh -huh. So it, it was kept about. Well, right now we've not we 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 ought to replant it now. It's getting it's beginning to get too tall. But we've been able to keep it down uh -huh. to I'd say two feet. And um, so I, then I, I thought, well, gee, I like this. And um, then I was a little bit scared to go to the landscape man. He would say, oh, no, that's no good, you know. So I went to the architect and I said, what do you think of this? He said, gee, I think you may have something there. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm scared to go to Bummy and tell him. Now, who is, is this? Bummy's the landscape uh -huh. man. And the architect is Francie uh -huh. Abreu. And he said, I'll tell you what we do. He said, I, we'll stake it out. We'll put strings and stake it out, and then we'll tell Bummy. So that's what we did, and Bummy liked it. Now, Bummy, it's really quite a, um, every year the garden club comes. They've come for Christ Church. They make a garden tour. Uh -huh. And they usually have 10 different houses on the tour. And uh, the next year, the same house won't be on somebody else's house to be on. But they've had us on every mm -hmm. single year. And they were so upset because the president came one and they had to counsel at the <laughs> last minute. And everybody was furious with them. They were furious with the president. <laughs> he lost more votes over that. <laughs> and because um, the Secret Service said, absolutely, you could not have it when, when he was down there. Because they go through that place with fine tooth comb to, they look in the holes in trees to see if anybody has put a bomb in them, great. and they're right, they sure. And you could come through in three or four days and have it timed, I suppose, for when he was mm -hmm. there. Well, anyway, um, 
the garden's really gotten quite famous. So there's my ambition. I did achieve my ambition uh -huh. in one poem. And, um, but uh, um, Bummy um, takes, uh, takes students down from the University of Georgia. They come down, landscape garden students, and he takes them around. He gets all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did the planning. I did the design. But I said, well, also said, I want a green garden. I want a shrub garden. I don't want a garden that I put in annuals because mm -hmm. I have plenty of annuals up in, up in Connecticut. All right. Yeah, I was, when I was reading through some of the papers of Renold, and I think I had told you that I came across some letters that um, Bob had written your mother while she was staying in um, Baltimore with your father at that time. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about how they were getting the, um, the rooms ready and that type of thing. And she said that, um, that Mr. Reynolds' wing was ready and thought it would be quiet and he would be undistracted mm -hmm. and undisturbed there and all. So where was he? He was in what we call the den. As you come in the front door, what is now the front door, mm -hmm. to the right. And it was the same paneling that's in there now, mm -hmm. and a big picture window. Mm -hmm. And um, he had a bed there, in that chest. And that's where he died, in that room. And, um, but that was not the front door then. That mm -hmm. was um, uh, just a little side door. Mm -hmm. We came in right straight through the, uh, the porch and through the reception uh -huh. room, where the garden is now. Mm -hmm. And um, oh, the little room um, that we now sort of use like a ladies' room mm -hmm. uh, there off that same door, mm -hmm. uh, that never had an entrance on that hall. It, it, you only could enter it through the, through the uh, library. Mm -hmm. And it was um, a kind of a, uh, what's a little retreat, mm -hmm. little retreat room, it's a little quiet room. You could go and have a quiet conversation and mm -hmm. close the door, not mm -hmm. because everybody could hear you talking in the front hall, in the reception hall. You never had to have a secret. <laughs> All you had to do was uh, <laughs> listen up from the balcony, you would hear everything going on there. So there was at least one place where you could get off and, and have a private conversation. Uh -huh. It was it was decorated pretty much like it is. It's not changed. But they, we didn't have that telephone situation back. It was a little bit bigger room. Mm -hmm. But you could go in the library and you'd never see the door that led into it. It was kind of inconspicuous where you entered. Mm -hmm. To the uh, to the left, in the fireplace that you faced. Mm -hmm. And then um, what what you're now using as a sort of extended library, that was just a, a porch. Mm -hmm. I think those shelves were put in after Renolda became Renolda Inc. Mm -hmm. And we had the piano. That was our music room, library and music room. Mm -hmm. Is that the piano that's there now? Is that the pa piano that you used? One of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the other one was one that the Babcocks had up here and uh -huh. took down. You um, you did take music lessons, didn't you? Oh my goodness! <laughs> yeah, I took piano for eight years, and I took um, violin for four months, and I, you know, guitar, and uh, and I can't play but one piece. <laughs> organ, I took organ for two years. <laughs> uh, the organ was I'd love to play the organ. I was always playing that with the records. Uh huh. And I think Mother got a kick out of it too, because <laughs> then ladies, I would be behind the screen there playing the organ and. I used to say, who is playing the organ? She said, why, Nancy. Oh, she mean she's playing like that, you know. And mother wouldn't tell him right off the bat. <laughs> and then she'd have to confess up that I had a record. <laughs> but when I started to take the violin, um, I, um, oh, what a, every, Smith was taking the saxophone. Uh-oh. And we thought, we, everybody thought they'd put up with enough. They didn't have to listen to a squeaking violin. So they hit the ceiling. What? Is, oh, we can't take this anymore, you know. So I got myself, I said, well, you won't have to listen to me. I'll take to the woods, you see. <laughs> so I did. I always, I went out to the woods to practice. And I had this little stray dog that followed me home from school. Of course, I'd given him some of my lunch. That's why he followed me. And we called him Mont Petit. Um, did I tell you this in the first uh, record? I mean, oh, yeah. well, you, you told me about the dog, but you didn't tell me about going out to the woods to practice. practice. <laughs> <laughs> we 
Well, uh, we went out there one day, and I had my alarm clock, so I wouldn't practice too long. <laughs> and um, let's see, I had the violin, I had the music stand, I had the little dog. And uh, I was working away at it, and the alarm went off, and at that moment, a horseback rider passed by. And to hear the squeaky, well, the horse reared up on its hind legs. Uh -uh. And she stayed on, but she didn't have time to look and see what all this was about. And I thought afterwards, I bet she thought it was a strange sight. Here she thought she was miles from anywhere. <laughs> and to have an alarm clock go off and a howling dog and those squeaking sounds I was making. But the violin didn't last long. I didn't I didn't get I didn't get much accomplished there. Yeah. And the and the organ I took after I got up to to Rosemary Hall. But you know it had spoiled me to have all those records. Mm -hmm. I couldn't play like that overnight, certainly not, and so it sort of lost its interest. I could get so much more music out of a record than I could get out of my hands. Now this is one of the records that you could put into that organ, is that oh, right? Yes, you can play it uh -huh. now like that. Uh -huh. That's what I was saying. But you had to do something about it, but it kept it from uh, seeming so mechanical. Mm -hmm. But then again, you know, I bought an organ for my house up here. I had an organ in it. And um, I had a Hammond organ that mm -hmm. you could play on records, and I, um, I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If this was electronic, uh, that one, of course, is a pipe organ, mm -hmm. a real, real pipe organ. Mm -hmm. Mine didn't have any uh, to take any of the um, huge amount of space that the pipe organ did. Mm -hmm. How long did um, how long did Smith's saxophone lessons last? I can I just don't imagine. Know, but we, I used to come in on the piano, so you know we were pretty. <laughs> It wasn't terribly musical. It was more of a sound. Really. <laughs> I can just imagine uh, somebody beginning on a, on a wind instrument like that. <laughs> oh, yeah, and of course they are so loud, too. Mm -hmm. At least I think it's better than the drums, if you're taking up a drum. <laughs> um, do you want to talk some more about the house? Or I think sure. we have, um, if you want, why don't we just go over... Um, um, I guess so, perhaps the, the the most stable time in the house perhaps was say between 1918 and 19 or maybe well let's say 1921 to 24 mm -hmm. and, and we'll talk about who was where then because that's um, your mother's remarried well, and children are, are mm -hmm. kind of growing up and that type of thing. Oh. Uh, because the end room would be Mother and Mr. Johnston. And that's the east, and the east end. That's the, um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the next, what at one time was the sewing room, and the next time Bob Ed and the nurses, then was Ed Johnston's dressing room, mm -hmm. where he kept his clothes, and there was a bed there. Smith stayed the same, the, the guest room stayed the same, and Dick stayed the same, Across, the two boys were sharing mm -hmm. the sleeping porch mm -hmm. on the south side of the house, and um, I was—I really think mine was the best room in the house. I thought it was—it had a bath and a nice roomy bath, and and it had uh, what two exposures. Mm -hmm. Well, this was the room Mother stood over watching that man at the at the back door. Let's talk oh, about, about that. Yeah, let's talk about that. She was in this um, room that we have here listing as six, my room or her room, and she heard this noise, and it was shortly after Daddy died, I think. I don't think it was very long. And she heard something, a loud, loud voice in the back, and you, her, her room overlooked the, the um, entrance down below mm -hmm. to the basement, and he was yelling for Kate Smith. Well, because that was Mother's maiden name, so she got her shotgun and she stood here at this window, and she held it on and wanted to know what he was doing. Well, they and then while the police came, somebody else called the police, but she kept him there. She wouldn't let him move. I expect he was drunk, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And but the police said that they couldn't hold him really very long because he literally had not tried to break in. Mm -hmm. She she. Uh, uh, accosted him before he had gotten even his hand on uh -huh. the door. She couldn't say his hand was there and he was trying to get break in. Uh -huh. So they kept him on there overnight and scared him a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
I guess, and sent him back to Mount Airy, which is apparently where he came from. Mm -hmm. But she was, she was game for an awful lot. <laughs> was she um, accustomed to using a gun? I mean, yeah, you? she would go hunting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I had her a hunting dress. It was a, um, it's down there, Renault. Uh -huh. It's so a cocky with a little velvet. Wouldn't you have velvet and a little <laughs> white collar and quite dressy. What kind of hunting would they do? A quail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think they did any other kind of hunting. Maybe doves, mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And they would go, um, but they had, Mother had some property down in um, Alabama, I think, with the forest, woods, timber, timberland. Mm -hmm. And they, um, I think she enjoyed going down there to inspect it. And I think down there is where she, but there was quite a bit of quail hunting around, around uh, uh, Winston, mm -hmm. too. As long as you had a, a lot of small farmers where they um, had fields mm -hmm. of growing things that the quail liked, you'd get the quail. Uncle Jim was loved to go shooting, and he used to take me, but I never shot anything. I wasn't wearing my glasses, <laughs> and um, he got real cross with me. I didn't tell you this stuff. Uh -uh. I've told you so much now, I forget <laughs> what I had. Well, he's, um, he got kind of cross because I never killed anything. And I think he thought that I was just too kind-hearted and wouldn't do it. Well, that wasn't the case. I just didn't see them. I don't, and I didn't care what I killed. It mm -hmm. is true I didn't care what I did. I enjoyed going and watching the dogs and just being out somewhere like mm -hmm. that. And um, so finally one day he um, said to me, Now, Nancy, if you don't kill something today, I'm not going to ever take you shooting again. And I said, well, I try, Uncle Jim, but I just don't seem to hit him. And of course, later when I realized I was nearsighted, of course, I knew why I didn't hit him. I couldn't, <laughs> really couldn't see them. And uh, so finally he saw a rabbit, absolutely rabbit, sitting in the ground, sitting on the ground, and scared him out. And Uncle Jim said, there he is, now you shoot that rabbit. Well, I didn't see him. I said, so he said, I'll aim it for you, and you just pull that trigger. He was afraid he'd have to live up to this thing, you see. <laughs> so he did. He aimed it, and I pulled the trigger, and by God, if the bullet didn't go right between the rabbit's ears, and the rabbit flew off, just running off. <laughs> and I never touched it. And he never took me shooting again. <laughs> so then I was, uh, um, of course, I didn't have any dogs or anything like that, so I had to go. The best I could do after that was go squirrel shooting. But I, I was up at Rowing Gap and I almost, I was by myself shooting. And I had my foot up and my gun resting on it and I, a squirrel was up there running around the tree. You uh -huh. know? And I um, was all ready to shoot it when it came my side of the tree. And my foot slipped and of course my finger was on the trigger and I pulled it and I missed my toe by three inches. Oh gosh. And I was way down the mountainside. Well that scared me a little bit. I thought, well, I'm a fool to go out without my, without somebody with me. So that was, uh, and anyway, Mary would, I'd bring back a few squirrels. I did kill some squirrels. And when I'd bring them home, um, John Carter would serve them. And Mary would say, oh, that's a squirrel, poor little squirrel, poor little squirrel. <laughs> Teasing me about it. And of course, nobody could eat it after that. <laughs> So nobody enjoyed eating them, and I, I almost shot my foot off, so that ended my shooting days. So maybe I got a digression there. So I think you, well, yeah, down, I, down in this room down here, that was um, the downstairs bedroom that's way in the back of the pantry. Mm -hmm. Lizzie stayed there, mm -hmm. and the monkey that we had in the... Uh, and uh, she was the uh, telephone operator after we were getting older. Mm -hmm. By the time we came out mm -hmm. here, she was not really a nursemaid. She was mm -hmm. telephone operator. Mm -hmm. And we must have really had the, an elaborate telephone system. We, we had, did. had telephones like out in the outbuildings. And did you have them out there? I uh, could we phone out there? I'm not. Sh I know. I think we could had to do an outside number. But uh -huh. this was like a, a switchboard that if you'd get an outcoming call, and you'd have to mm -hmm. connect it to a room. Mm -hmm. And I think you could connect it for the night. Mm -hmm. You could connect, Mother could have connected hers for the night or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And she'd get outcoming, um, incoming outside calls uh -huh. through that. 
And um, but uh, Lizzie had that room, mm -hmm. and then later, uh, Ben Bernard became mother's secretary. Now that was before she married Ed Johnson. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, I think I told you yesterday, uh, he was um, a brother of a roommate mm -hmm. at, at college, mm -hmm. one of the colleges, I think, at uh, Sullins. Mm -hmm. Might have been at Dad Greensboro. Had she had a secretary before named Mr. Orr? Oh, by yeah. Chance? Uh, I was wondering. Mr. Orr that. was a lawyer, I think. I don't think he was a secretary. Now, maybe he did some secretarial type work. Mm -hmm. Um. She had Miss Blanche Gunn. I think Miss Blanche Gunn was here when Ben Bernard was. Mm -hmm. She did more of the typing type of mm -hmm. thing, and Ben Bernard was some. Um, oh, he was. He was game for taking me to school or to college uh -huh. if I had to be chaperoned uh -huh. or, or uh, uh, squiring mother around. He was courting mother. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. And, but she she uh, turned him down. Then he started, you know, Miss Gray, and <laughs> they married. <laughs> but he was nice. I liked. Him. He taught. He had taught dancing in New York, ballroom dancing. Huh. So he taught us all ballroom dancing. So was he living there at the house while they were courting? Um. Yeah, I guess so. And he was a friend of of Ed Johnson. Uh -huh. It wasn't. Uh, and he stayed in this room. Mm -hmm. Now, did he stay on after Ed and Mother were married? I think so, but I'm not sure. It wasn't any quick um, uh, departure mm -hmm. or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So now let's see. As I say, don't forget this room was sometimes not there, this room above. That, that we've talked about as number eight uh -huh. in our sketch. And I think it was the last of period and that wasn't there, but Well, I think we at least we have a good mm -hmm. idea of where people were and th that type of thing. Mm -hmm. As much as we as much as we need. Um let's see. What were some of the other sort of odds and ends that we wanted to, to talk about here mm. at the, um, we did the story about your mother fending off the, the, uh, <laughs> the ungentlemanly mm. caller. <laughs> well, uh, let's see. Gosh, I have, um, um, and you were also telling me the other night about, um, a practice that your Uncle Will had of naming one of his trotters after each of you children. Um, friends and, and not only the family, uh -huh. but friends too. Because he, he had a Bob Galloway uh, as well as, he had his friends in there. But he had a house named Dick Reynolds, and he always used to say that all these houses would take on the characteristics of the people he named it for. Mm -hmm. Well, Dick Reynolds was a very fine house, but he was quite frisky. <laughs> and so that lived up to what he said, what Uncle Will said. And then Mary Reynolds, well, she was the greatest of all. She was um, the one that won the Hamiltonian, which is the prize of a trotting horse. Uh -huh. That is the top in the nation. And um, he had a Nancy, I think that was a Nancy Bagley. And she turned out to be just an old broodmate. <laughs> <laughs> what did you, what do you think of that? <laughs> just uh, well, I think it's characteristic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. At least I would say I might have found broodmate with all my children. <laughs> uh, you want me to tell you the story about um, the whole side of a bed on yeah. acting? California, yeah, well, just very recently I was out in California and I, um, well, I guess it was when I went out there to get a divorce the last time. And I went over to uh, the racetrack with some of the other people that I met out there uh, to Sacramento. I was in, I was in Nevada, but I, they let you go out for the day mm -hmm. if you don't spend 24 hours there. And so we, we were watching this race, and of course I didn't know any of the horses out there, but they did have some harness races. 
and uh, one of the horses in the harness race was named um, Tootie Lambert. Well, Lambert is, of course, part of the family, and I thought, my Lord, I bet you, uh, that horse is bred from one of Uncle Bill's. So, of course, I put my dollar up, or two dollars, whatever the betting ticket was, and it came in first. <laughs> So I thought, well, gee, that is just wonderful. But I came, I, I wrote uh, back to Winston about it, and David Lambert, I knew he would know Uncle Will's mm -hmm. horses. And it turned out that this was a horse, uh, had bred from a horse of David's. Uh -huh. And David had had a girlfriend named Tootie, oh, Trudy, I uh, know Tootie it was. And so he had named a horse uh, uh, after this girl. <laughs> <laughs> But at least it was family horse, it wasn't like a wheels. Gosh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I always think there's something else that maybe we'd like to talk about is um, um, your grandson, his name is Russell Long, right? And mm -hmm. he's going to be skippering one of the America's Cup. Yeah. Well, he's, um, it's unusual for anyone his age, he's 24. Mm -hmm. And most of the, of course, the, all the young men are crews on the, those boats because they need the strength of a, a young person. But usually the skipper and the navigator are men of, oh, uh, in their 40s mm -hmm. or 50s that have had a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. So this is um, quite unusual to have one challenging, mm -hmm. wanting to defend the car. And he's, um, he's got a new boat. The new boat's called the, the Clipper. And uh, we don't know whether it'll be chosen or not, but there was um, an article yesterday, uh, well, they, they sent out all the, there's one newsletter, mm -hmm. and it comes out every Friday. And this one, um, they have something about each boat. Mm -hmm. And they said that um, Russell was um, cracking down on discipline of his crew, and he said it, they need it. <laughs> So he's, uh, I guess, it, and it, I got to think, well, I suppose being young, it is more mm -hmm. difficult for him to discipline his crew. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they, they're pretty strict, um, at least the ones I've known in the past, of not um, having anything to, the boys not drinking too much mm -hmm. um, when they're working so mm -hmm. hard. And whether it's beer or on, on anything else, mm -hmm. they, once a week, I think, they um have a spray if they mm -hmm. want it. But um, I think in the past I've known they maybe limited to one. Mm -hmm. So I gather that's it, or maybe it's staying up late. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So you'll be um, cruising this summer, you'll be out at Well, sea. I have a charter boat mm -hmm. and I'll be up there watching. And, um, we follow it around. I've, I've done it now for, followed those races around. I would say since 19, um, 1968, and then before that, 1962. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, whatever race has been since 19, uh, America's Cup race, since 1962. Mm -hmm. And um, I take anybody out in the daytime with it. I know, um, let's see, one thing that I wanted is, um, and this is just sort of my, sort of my assumption of things, and, and that is that, um, well, I just sort of want to know how you define yourself. I mean, I guess that maybe, you know, if, you know, if you were identified, people would say the daughter of R.J. Reynolds, mm -hmm. the former wife of Henry Bagler, Bagley or the mother of Smith Bagley or something mm -hmm. like that. But without any of those sort of tags, you know, just like, who is Nancy Reynolds without just her? Just I would say nobody. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> uh, well, 
Well, you mean what do I think of my character? Is that what you mean? Right, or how, or, or, yeah, just with without sort of those kinds of appendages, just to define yourself. Well, the thing I showed you this morning, you know, like a philosophy. Mm-hmm. Because I think I was, while I wrote that little thing, I can't remember which one I found it in. I think that's one that's gone off to be Xerox. Oh. Mm-hmm. I, um, I think I've stuck to, I mean, I think my, I, you don't realize it, but I think your character really is formed early in your years. And it, sure, it's foolish to, um, to think uh, that you rely always on, on um, a philosophy or things that you thought of when you were 16, but I think you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you, you form your character and you form what you, your ideals. And um, though I do think it's nonsense, I think you shouldn't, you shouldn't do that. You should rethink it. Mm -hmm. But without um, we don't push ourselves into thinking about what we want to be unless we're at that age. Mm -hmm. After that, you feel that you you're working toward whatever you. What you we don't know what you're going to do when you're in your teens, because mm -hmm. you've got all life ahead of you. So you make up your mind then what you want to do. Maybe it's not very uh, strong ambition. Maybe it is. And I probably more or less accepted being a mother and and uh, wife mm -hmm. as my my uh, which I do think that I mean I'm all for women's lib mm -hmm. today because I think a lot of things would have been different for me if I had if people had had that philosophy now for instance Uncle Will he didn't care whether I went to college or not mm -hmm. if I'd been a boy he'd have made me mm -hmm. and that's wrong I should have gone and. Um, but a woman, oh, what difference does it make? She's just going to get married and have children. She's not going to have any life of her own. And I think um, that that's where I'm all for women's mm -hmm. live today, because I think it's great. And I think even, sure, right in your, um, every part of your school life, they did the same thing. Now, mm -hmm. I think they still do a lot. I mean, you, you ask a little boy, what are you going to be when you grow up? You don't ask a little girl. Mm -hmm. I think we're beginning to, to wake up to that fact. Mm -hmm. But I think um, um, a woman in that day was supposed to help her husband and do things like that. She was, she was the one that was supposed to sacrifice everything. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard, uh, you, if you're taught that on every circumstance, every class that you're in, I don't mean your parents taught you that, mm -hmm. you, except that they ignore your ambition otherwise. Mm -hmm. Then you, you sort of get it ingrained in you. Mm -hmm. but it seems like that that your mother, she was, but she, I guess she sort of what we would call today sort of the superwoman in mm -hmm. a way because she was the, the mother mm -hmm. and the wife and and also yeah. the, sort of the builder of mm -hmm. Renolda. And I think in, in, you know, you've said that you think you sort of patterned your. Mm -hmm. your, your life after your mother in lots of ways and so except I mean, to you I, I think I would um, cater to your husband I mean mm -hmm. he always got the paper in the morning for mm -hmm. instance mm -hmm. instead of me and, yeah you were telling me that yeah <laughs> and things like that I mean it was accepted that you you did that mm -hmm. just as much as you accepted that he would hand you out the door first or something mm -hmm. else. But um, I think it's great to to in that the women are coming into their own, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know whether it makes problems for the children or not. Um, I don't think it will really, but maybe it does. Maybe it it means a little neglect there, but. But I, th I do, I think that, um, I, 
I don't think I'm, I think I'm an unselfish person now whether I was just taught that or whether I just accepted that in position and um, therefore I have I'm trying to say every other generation because I think my children are not as thoughtful of me as I was if I would have been of my parents and uh, it's it's because I have I have thought first of them, so they have thought first of themselves. Mm -hmm. And they are independent, which I think is grand. And I'm, I'm glad they have their own life. They're not dependent on whether I approve of this or that or something else. They, they, they are really, I mean, it's your, their own life, they have to live it. But, um, Well, I'm just going in circles now and talking, <laughs> so we... <laughs> so, are there... So, what do you... What do you... What are your goals now? I mean, what do you... At age 70? <laughs> right, at age 70. <laughs> to take what's coming to me and do so cheerfully. And I, I can... I do. I'm more selfish now than I used to be. <laughs> I, I do what I want to do. <laughs> Joy myself in a quiet way is what I want. So do you want to close it now? All right. No, I'll think of something in a minute as soon as we go. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we're on now. Well, I thought of hedged when you asked me about my religion. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's terribly clear-cut, but it is based on the fact that just as I'm nearsighted, and I can't see anybody without my glasses, I think that the, we are all like nearsighted people when we think of God. We can't really understand it. We can't expect to understand it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, if anything, I'm... I never heard the word deist in my childhood, mm -hmm. but when I took history at Columbia, I uh, suddenly uh, read about the deist and what they believe, and it seemed to be the nearest thing that I had made up in my own mind about religion. Uh -huh. I mean, um, Franklin was a deist. That's what I was just yeah. getting ready to say. And I think Jefferson was. Anyway, there were amazing number of people in um, England and France at that period, uh, 18th century, mm -hmm. who were. And uh, I can't say that I'm exactly with them on everything at all, but it's the feeling that, yes, there must be a God. And, um, but I, I feel that we can't really understand him. We mm -hmm. can't, uh, I don't, and I think it's immaterial whether we do or not. I think we should live a life that is um, moral, ethical, as taught in the Bible. I think that um, Jesus lived. I think he was an outstanding person, prophet, the way his, uh, his recommendations, mm -hmm. everything. And, but to me, he is love. Mm -hmm. God is love. Jesus is love. And a love of brotherhood of man. And, um, well, I just don't think it's anything to worry about. <laughs> But I certainly um, wouldn't say whether well, I'm going to hell or heaven or um, I think it's immaterial what happens to me. Yeah, mm -hmm. that help? <laughs> yes, that, that's... Um. And uh, let's see. I got a letter in the mail from Stratton Corner. Now, he was my brother's secretary. Mm -hmm. And when I was down there, I, had to, I left her early from Winston this time. Mm -hmm. I was going to have dinner with Strat. Apparently, Strat said that he wanted to talk to me because he was thinking of writing a book about Dick. 
and he wanted to know how I felt about it. He felt that Dick had not had um, the kind of publicity that he should have had, mm -hmm. that he had been called a playboy when he really wasn't. There were so many things that he'd done that were not playboy. So um, I wrote Stratton. I didn't have dinner with him because mm -hmm. I wasn't feeling well and came home. But I told him I was sorry and I certainly wouldn't, I would not, I'm, I think if he had that added, he ought to go ahead and write the book, write mm -hmm. the book of it. So Stratton writes back this morning and he says that he doesn't think he's up to it anymore, but he does feel strongly about that, so I think you ought to go and see it. I was getting ready to say maybe if he doesn't want to write, mm -hmm. that he would like to talk, mm -hmm. and that sometimes yeah. that, mm -hmm. that, um, that you get So I want to tell him that I, I told you to come by and talk to him. Okay. And, um... I know there was an article, did you see any published on Dick um, in reading up about this mm -hmm. thing? I, I the, there was, did you see the New York, uh, uh, New York Times article? I don't think so. Well, um, they wrote one of the best. And at first it kind of threw me a little bit and then one of his friends in New York said that they thought that was one of the best articles because it showed how much more he'd done than just Playboy. And um, if, if Strat has never seen it, gee, I ought to have sent that down. I think it's right, excuse me. I guess so. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about my brother Smith. Mm -hmm. And um, if I think he said he 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 claimed uh, the author of the book that uh, he'd solved it that it was suicide. Is that right? Is yeah. that what he thought he'd solved? Yeah. And he thought he'd solved it because of the um, sheriff's attitude or uh, racial thing. Well, um, if by any chance it was suicide. I think it would have come more from the suddenly discovering that she was depraved uh, than anything else. That's the only thing, the Jewish thing would have been ridiculous because mm -hmm. he certainly knew that Libby was Jewish and what difference did it make if he didn't? Right. He would not have been shocked by that. Um, but she was, a, a, to me, and certainly to this book, a depraved person. And I think uh, Smith, a young, um, idealized, idealizing mm -hmm. person, and uh, he was brought up in the South to idealize women, particularly. I think that he was shocked into sudden realization of what he'd married. Now, I'm not still sure that it was a suicide. I think by, and it, it might have been uh, an accident, and she might have been, have thought he was committing suicide and trying to get the gun, and but between them it went off. Mm -hmm. I think it's more likely than that he actually um, deliberately tried to, he, he might have been trying to pretend he was going to, mm -hmm. a half-hearted way. And he was free in using a gun. I don't think he was drunk that night. I think she might have been, yes. But anyway, it's uh, my feeling is just knowing that he was not a weak character. He was not a person to um, begging her to do this and that and sobbing and, mm -hmm. and please marry me. <laughs> I don't think that's ridiculous mm -hmm. to think he did that. Mm -hmm. And or for anyone that knew him to think he did. But. Um, yeah, I think you, I think I don't I don't think she deliberately tried to murder him either. I think if if it if she, I think it would could have been very easily accidental. Mm -hmm. Of of him threatening her. Yes, with the gun. I'm sure he got the gun probably. And um of she trying perhaps trying to get it away from him between them it went off. Mm -hmm. But um But as far as, I, I, I don't, uh, he, he didn't blame our family for trying to squelch the thing like the New York papers did. Because they really thought the family, you, always, you read them, you thought the family had uh, determined to get this darling little actress into jail and everything mm -hmm. else. And 
I, we, we felt the helpless ones because all the newspapers were sticking up for her. Mm -hmm. And, well, anyway, I really have nothing else to say. I have no knowledge of any of it. But uh, I wish I had. If I had, I would have spoken long ago. Mm -hmm. One, one sort of a word that you used, and I think that was, that he was idealistic. And mm -hmm. I think that even though it's, you know, we we know that he was, what, 20 at the time? Or yeah. 21? Mm -hmm. 20. 20. He wasn't 21 yet. That 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 is still an idealistic mm -hmm. age. That's right. And um, that, that we forget that. And I don't think he realized what kind of woman she really was. And whether she was as bad as this man made out, I don't know. Oh, just uh, then this is, is kind of uh, uh, not sad about it, but uh, she lived up here in um, Stanford, mm -hmm. edge of Stanford and Greenwich. I think our address was literally Greenwich. And uh, of course, that occasionally I can see in the newspaper that she had the place open with daffodils. Now that's a Reynolds tradition, mm -hmm. you see, mm -hmm. and the woodland was filled with daffodils, which was kind of amused me. Mm -hmm. And um, when she died, he didn't say this, but I, under, um, I understand that she left that place to Boston University. And um, a friend of mine, a oh, garden club lady, a former president before I was president, she was the one that was so anxious for me to be president. And I um, finally didn't succumb, as I think I told you. But she came to me, and she did not know anything, any connection between Libby Holman and me. And she said um, that she, um, Libby Holman had died and had left this t her house to Boston University and that uh, they were trying to figure out how to, uh, how to uh, keep it, what to do with it. Mm -hmm. Well, I had just come up from Renolda being very enthusiastic. And I explained to her that I was uh, an ex-sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but she did she had not known it mm -hmm. but I don't know that I explained right off the bat but anyway I started telling her what they did at Renault and why they do the same thing up here <laughs> at Libby's house <laughs> and it amused me to be consulted because literally this was my father's money and it had left the home mm -hmm. left the <laughs> and I was being consulted of all people as to what to do with it and she got enthusiastic. I got out all kinds of pamphlets that I had on Renolda and everything else. And she uh, then uh, she asked me if I wouldn't get on the board. And then that's when I explained to her that I would not get on the board. And why? She went ahead, and that's what they did for a while up there. And uh, uh, then, of course, my curiosity was up. I'd never been up, of course. So I, I um, after it was open, they gave, I had a, an... Uh, I don't know what was going on, but anyway, I got one of my good friends, and I said, come on, I don't want to go by myself, but the daffodils, that's what, mm -hmm. it was open again for the daffodils, Lee. And so we went up, and we looked all around, we went through the house, and we looked at that, and she had a lot of pictures still in the, in the basement room. And then I went up once again um, to a lecture that she had that I really wanted to, mm -hmm. I went for the lecture, not, mm -hmm. for the, not for the peeping around corners. And of course, I got caught by somebody <laughs> seeing me up there, you know, and I couldn't, I didn't have to make any ex explanation, I just went for the lecture. But I did think that was a funny uh, episode uh -huh. to have happened afterwards. Pretty ironic, but... Mm -hmm. sort of now she's, cl they've closed that, uh, Boston University had closed it, they didn't have a, make a go of it. Hmm. But um, they kept it open for sale, I don't know, I, I think it's up for sale. And I think she had provided that if they didn't, they could sell it. But she didn't know whether they could use it in any useful way or not. Mm -hmm. But it uh, it wasn't that spectacular the daffodils weren't. It was very pretty, but it, uh, quite extensive woodlands. Mm -hmm. Well, it was just so I put daffodils all through these woods. Mm -hmm. And there have been daffodils down between mm -hmm. the house and Lake Catherine. Hat. Is that oh, where yes, they, they, they were. Mm-hmm. I think I'd seen those. And all the way out to, out to the main road, mm -hmm. 
all the way down in those woods. Mm-hmm. And you know, daffodils will last nicely for five or six years, and then they peter out. They they mm-hmm. crowd themselves out. Really, if you got if you dug them up and separated them and started them singly again, they would bloom, continue to bloom. So once one of, during one of Renolda's um, vacant periods, that when no one was there, I did pay for the daffodils. I, I appreciated them. Mm-hmm. Pay for them to be dug up and put down again. Mm-hmm. And they go along. I mean, whoever's doing it now, I don't know, but they do continue with those daffodils. Mm-hmm. I suppose Wake Forest is. And I guess so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are there other things that you want? I think that covers anything I had to say. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's plenty. <laughs>